Well, you can join me in opening your Bibles to the book of Leviticus. We're continuing our series through this book, and we're in Leviticus because we believe what the Bible says about the book of Leviticus. The Apostle Paul says that all Scripture, which includes Leviticus, is God's Word for us, and it makes us wise for salvation through Jesus, and it's profitable. So we believe that this is ultimately about Jesus, and it is for our good. And so that's why we're in this book, even though it's largely um, neglected and sometimes takes a lot of work to see how this is about Jesus and for our good. And so we are now in chapter 23, and this is the chapter on Israel's calendar. Now, every culture has a calendar with a rhythm of holidays. And it seems that as you look around how calendars have worked throughout various cultures, humans are wired to give some kind of order to how we experience time. And there's always meaning involved. So you can tell a lot about a culture's values by looking at their calendar, by looking at the days they set apart and the pattern that they have in their calendar um, for observance. So our calendar in America has several layers of meaning several kind of layers to the calendar holidays, and each layer shows our values. So one layer is focusing on the creation and sustaining of our nation. So we celebrate Independence Day, and we honor those who gave their lives in war on Memorial Day. We honor veterans on Veterans Day. We focus on President's Day, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and so forth. Another layer the second layer would be a Christian calendar. So most Christians celebrate Christmas and Easter. Some traditions have the whole year shaped by Christian events and seasons, so including Lent and Pentecost and so forth. A third layer is what we could call the consumer calendar. And the consumer calendar is really a hijacking of the first two layers for consumerism. So we take Thanksgiving and we add Black Friday for all the deals. We use Memorial Day to get discounts for when we need a new microwave or refrigerator or some appliance. Easter is the time to get the marshmallow peeps. Mother's Day is for buying flowers. Father's Day for gadgets. Christmas, of course, is the biggest shopping season of the year. So what would you conclude about America's values by looking at our calendar? Well, you would say, Okay, it looks like some of us like Jesus, most of us like America, all of us like stuff. <laughs> so the point is that calendars express and shape our values. They reinforce certain values. Calendars give, you could say, a symbolic shaping to our cultural life together. So just like every other culture, Israel's calendar it was filled with meaning and significance, and it shaped their values. So this chapter that we're about to read is not just a public service announcement of the time off for Israel and how to make sure to make, they, make sure they had the right holidays off together. No, their calendar was filled with culture-forming, value-shaping holidays. And this was their primary meaning. God ordered Israel's calendar to symbolically communicate the story of their salvation. That's at the heart of what their calendar was all about. The holidays helped them see that they were part of a bigger story, a story of redemption, and all of it pointed forward to Jesus. So let's read Leviticus 23. We'll get through most of it, and then we'll walk through it together. And this is on page 101, by the way, if you don't have a Bible, page 101 on the Bible, in the Bibles around the room under seats. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places." These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord, 
For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, but you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of firstfruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord, so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. On the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, a year old, without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the grain offering with it shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma, and the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hin. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until this same day, until you've brought the offering of your God. It's a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two-tenths of an ephah, ephah and, then, and they shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. And you shall present with the bread seven lambs, a year old without blemish, and one bull from the herd and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offerings, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs a year old as a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. It is a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout all your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. We'll pause there and let's pray together for the Lord's help. Our Father, we thank you for your word and we read it and receive it trusting that this does make us wise for salvation through Jesus and is profitable for every good work. And so we pray that you would help us to understand the significance of this text for us and for our lives and for our witness in the world. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is Israel's calendar, and God ordered it to symbolically communicate the story of salvation that they were a part of. So we'll walk through Israel's key holidays. And then we'll see how Jesus fulfills them. And then we'll see how this relates to us today. So Israel's calendar, Jesus' fulfillment, and then our lives. All right, so Jesus, or Israel's calendar. So the first rhythm on their calendar is a weekly Sabbath. So that was verse 3. It says, six days shall work be done. But on the seventh day, which would have been their Saturday, is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It's a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. So on the seventh day of the week, they were to rest and not do ordinary work, and they were to gather together. It was a set-apart day to gather and rest. So that's recalling the creation week from Genesis 1. So in Genesis 1 God is, and 2, Gen God is portrayed as a worker, and he ordered the world in six days and rested on the seventh. And the rest there, by the way, is not because he was tired. It's a rest of satisfaction and a job well done, like a woodworker who creates a table. And then after all of that, steps back and looks with gratefulness and delight and satisfaction that it's completed. So God rests and he's satisfied. And now Israel is to order their whole life according to this same rhythm. So remember, almost everything in Leviticus is tied back to Eden. And now we see that even their weekly schedule was built as a weekly schedule to reflect and recall that original order of creation. So God is not just giving them a day off. He's reordering their whole world and their whole experience of time. And one of the purposes of the Sabbath was also to let them enjoy their freedom. So they had been slaves in Egypt for centuries no time off, no days off, no rest, just hard labor. 
And now they're given a weekly day of rest as a blessing. And so Deuteronomy 5 says that the Sabbath was also a time to remember their liberty, their rescue. Now, sadly, over time, Israel's leaders turned this into a burden. So the leaders overregulated what counted as work and what counted as rest. And so they ended up creating a new kind of slavery. By the time of Jesus, they got angry at him for even healing someone on a Sabbath. So that's why Jesus had words for them, because they were missing the whole point of the Sabbath, which is rest and restoration. After this weekly Sabbath, God gave Israel seven key events in the year to celebrate. Now, most of them are clustered together in the spring and the fall. So their new year was the beginning of spring, which makes sense. Spring is the signal of new life, and we're looking forward to spring here after this past January that hardly showed the sun. And so their spring was the new year, and it was the new year also because it was set from the time that God brought Israel out of Egypt. So their exodus from Egypt was to set their calendar. So the whole calendar is oriented around their rescue. Not only that weekly rhythm and resting, remembering the rescue, but also the, the new year was started because of their rescue from Exodus. It was a, their gospel event. So it's similar to how Western calendars were, are now operating after being reset according to the coming of Jesus. So let's walk through each of these seven events. The first is Passover. This is verse 5. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. So they began their year remembering the Exodus. That was the, the reset of their calendar. And then here, on the 14th day of their first month, and this would have been March, April time, so spring was when their year started, the 14th day, they remember the Passover, and they do it at twilight because that is when God brought them out of Egypt. And that's when they partook of the first Passover. So the focus of the event was on the lambs that were sacrificed on that first Passover night. God was going to bring Israel out of Egypt. He was going to judge the Egyptians for their evil cruelty. And in this last evening, God was going to send a judgment over that would take the firstborn of every household, including animals. And for Israel to be spared... They didn't just get spared because they were God's people. They needed to have a substitute die in their place. So a lamb was sacrificed, which showed that Israel was under God's judgment just like Egypt. They too needed to be spared God's judgment. They needed to be delivered not just from Egypt, from, but from God's own wrath. And so the lamb was sacrificed in their place as the Passover lamb so that God's judgment would pass over them. And so they celebrated that at the Passover from being rescued from God's just judgment over their sin. The second feast is unleavened bread. It says verses 6 to 8. So this was the week that followed that Passover. They ate unleavened bread all week to recall how they ate unleavened bread when they fled Egypt. So they didn't have time for their bread to leaven, so they ate it unleavened. So do you see what God's having Israel do so far with these feasts? He's having them reenact and symbolically participate again in their gospel redemption, their rescue from Egypt. So once again, they're eating a lamb at night. Once again, they're eating unleavened bread as though they don't have time to let it leaven because that's what happened when they were first rescued. So this is a kind of participatory remembrance, a reenacting of their deliverance. And now it's a week-long drama that they're to reenact at the beginning of every year to recall the story of salvation they've enjoyed. The third event is first fruits. This is verses 9 to 14. This actually happens at the same time as these first two events. So it's on the Sabbath after the Passover. So there's a bit of an overlap here with unleavened bread. It's a feast that celebrates when God would bring them into the land of Canaan, and it's a celebration of their harvest, the barley harvest, most likely. And so they're to take some of that first harvest and dedicate it to God, and it was viewed as the first fruits. They give God the first fruits of their harvest as a way of saying thank you for the harvest, and it's also an expression of confidence and gratefulness that the rest of the harvest is yet to come, which is why it's the first fruits, because there will be more fruits and then last fruits to come. 
The fourth event is then later spring. It's the Feast of Weeks. It's seven weeks after the first fruits offering. So this is verses 15 and 16. It says, You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath. From the day that you brought the sheaf and wave and of the wave offering, you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. So seven weeks after first fruits, which is why it's called the Feast of Weeks, because they're counting these weeks until they do it. And since it's 50 days later, it was called Pentecost in Greek. So this celebrates the harvest of wheat. They gave various offerings to the Lord during that time, and they ate together. So those are the first events clustered together in spring. And then the last three events are clustered together in the seventh month. This would match kind of our September, October on our calendars. So these are the events of trumpets, atonement, and booths. So the fifth here is the Feast of Trumpets. So on the very first day of the seventh month, you see that seven is important here. Uh, seven feasts, the seventh is the Sabbath. They're counting seven weeks over and over now the seventh month is important, all recalling the creation week, getting their mindset back to creation because that's where history is going, a restoration of creation, but better. So that the, the first day of the seventh month, trumpets would blast through the land and Israel would celebrate a day of rest. And then the sixth event is in that month, it's the day of atonement. It's on the 10th day of the seventh month. And the tone of this event is different than the others. All the other events have a feasting kind of tone, mainly celebratory. But this event's different. It's not a day of feasting. It's a day of fasting. So look at verse, verses 27 and 28. Now on the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation. And you shall afflict yourselves, probably referring to fasting, and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. That's the event that Leviticus chapter 16 describes. It was one day of the year when all unresolved sin was dealt with, with a sacrifice of atonement. So the priest would offer two goats, one goat's killed as a sacrifice. The picture is of Israel's sins being placed on that goat, transferred to that goat, and then the goat dies in their place, taking the judgment of death for them, offered up to God so they can come in God's presence. The other goat was a picture of another aspect of atonement, which is bringing the sins to that goat and then sending it away. And so that's the removal of sin, so that the goat was banished from God's presence, banished into the wilderness. That's what we deserve. That's what happened to Adam and Eve, kicked out of Eden. We deserve to be banished from God's good creation. But that sacrifice pictures our sins being taken away and removed from us. The final event is the Feast of Booths. It's five days later. It lasted for a week. It's the most joyful feast. So the people would create makeshift booths to live in for the week. So why would they do that? Well, it's another drama, another play that they were living out another reenactment it's reenacting how they lived in booths when god rescued them from egypt and they were taken out so that's israel's calendar marked by a seven-day rhythm of work and rest and then seven events that were charged with meaning filled with reenactments of redemption so why would god give them this well we could say that he did it so that they would always remember their redemption they were a people that were always to remember the story they were part of, always to remember that they were people saved by grace. And so they live with gratitude. But there is more. Israel was embedded in a big story that didn't just reach back to the Exodus redemption. It reached back to Eden, to the beginning of creation. And it pointed forward to how God would ultimately solve the problem of sin points forward to Jesus and the new creation to come. And so their calendar helped them live within this ongoing story. So it was a temporary, symbol-laden calendar given to Israel to live within as they prepared for Jesus. So second, Jesus' fulfillment. So Israel's calendar pointed their minds to the past, to the present, and the future. So it pointed them to the past and creation and exodus it pointed them to the present for God's provision for them in the land. 
So they're still part of this ongoing story. God's providing for them, and they give him the first fruits. But the fact that their story starts in Eden means that it's bigger than their present. God is up to something bigger than what he did in the first exodus. He's up to something bigger than just blessing them in the land. And the prophets later on would draw attention to this over and over and over for Israel. Prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah would keep saying things like, there's going to be a new exodus. It's going to be so great you won't even remember the first one. There's going to be not just the land of Canaan flourishing, but a new creation that's going to blossom. I'm going to pour my spirit out on my people. And so Israel's living within this symbolic world that we've been seeing here through the whole book, and they knew it. And the whole setup is crying out for more, right? As they're living within this, they see God is now with them. This reminds me of Eden, except, wait, he's just in that little tent? Like, there's just this mix of the glory and wonder and gratefulness of God with us. And is this, surely this can't be it. And the glory and wonder of being forgiven through sacrifices and also animals dying for us. Really, that, that takes hell for us? That really makes us reconciled to God? And we have to keep repeating them. So this isn't really working as we'd hope. And look, we can go be with God. The priests are serving the tabernacle. The high priest can even go into the most holy place. And then they're all thinking, this is what a gift. And wait, just him? And just once a year? Doesn't seem like the Edenic walking in the cool of the day with the Lord. God delivered them from slavery in Egypt. What a gift. What a wonder. And very quickly they're realizing they needed a deeper deliverance. They needed to be delivered from not just slavery to Pharaoh, but slavery from their own addiction to sin. They needed new hearts. We're all born into the world addicted to self, the capital S. So everything in Leviticus, including their calendar, was a temporary, symbol-laden teaching tool. It was intended to cultivate hope in a future greater restoration. They're longing for a new Eden and even better. And that's what we're, we're longing for, a restoration of the world, of the world to the way it was always meant to be, a world without strife, a world where we will feast, Communal rest, joyful feasting with God. And so how does this new world come? Well, it's on its way here. And Jesus began to bring it, and he will one day return to finish it. So Jesus wanted to make this point obvious, that he came to fulfill the feasts. So he strategically planned his ministry in order to make it obvious. Do you realize that? Think of these key events. Just Jesus' death, his resurrection, and then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Do you realize that Jesus intentionally made those land on feast days? Those were already important days on Israel's calendar, and Jesus redefined them on purpose. And it wasn't just coincidence. It was his plan because this was the plan from the day that God gave this to Israel. It's not just that Israel had this calendar and then Jesus came and said, you know, we can do, we can one-up this. We can do better. Um, and those are kind of a hassle anyway. So let's, let's do something new. Here's, here's what, let's just make them now focus on my death. No, the whole point of giving Israel what, the calendar was because God's plan was already to have Jesus come in the future to die and rise and pour out his spirit and then renew creation. And so working backward from that plan, in a sense, Israel's given this calendar. So think of how Jesus approached his final week. When you read this, the story in the gospel accounts, the writers of the gospel keep drawing attention to this, that Jesus is planning everything he's doing. He went to Jerusalem at the time of Passover on purpose. He pre-planned the Passover meal. And when his disciples were eating with him, he announced that it was now going to be fulfilled in his own death. That was a radical moment. The Passover meal for centuries is used as this symbolic representation of their past exodus. But many Jewish people at the time did recognize, we need another exodus, we need another deliverance, and God's going to do it one day. 
And Jesus came and announced, your forward-looking expectation has now come to be fulfilled. He's redefining it. He said, this now points to my death, the bread and the cup, my body and blood. And then he was crucified at Passover. So Paul says, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. The first Passover was for Israel, but the new Passover is for all who trust Jesus. It's for you if you'll have him as your Savior. So we all deserve judgment for our sin. And just like Israel had a lamb die in their place, taking their judgment, this is what we do with Jesus. We trust him to be our Passover lamb who takes our judgment. So if you have not yet trusted him for that, you can today. Just like Israel trusted that the Lord was forgiving him through that lamb, you trust God's forgiveness through Jesus' sacrifice. Then he was raised on the third day, and the resurrection corresponded with the Feast of first fruits. It was a day when that first sheaf of barley was, the harvest was dedicated to God. The first fruits mean that the first of the harvest came up, right? The beginning of the harvest has come up, and there's more to come. It was anticipation of more to come. That's why the Apostle Paul refers to Jesus' resurrection as a first fruits. It's because Jesus was raised as the first fruits of a harvest to come. So think of resurrection as a great single harvest. And we die, our bodies are buried, they're planted in cemeteries like seeds. And by the way, this is why Christians have historically practiced burial and not cremation and the scattering of ashes. We lay the bodies down because we believe that a great harvest is coming. And so we lay the bodies down as if they're going to bed because they'll come up again. And so on that third day, the day of first fruits, celebrating the beginning of the harvest, Jesus rose. So resurrection is a harvest all through history, these bodies in the ground. And then Jesus joins humanity buried in the ground we're waiting for the great harvest of resurrection to come at the end of the age. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of history, boom, the harvest began. And not just a one-off random resurrection. The reason why the Apostle Paul calls Jesus' resurrection the first fruits is because it's the beginning of a great harvest, which is why every time a Christian is buried, it's buried in hope because the beginning of the harvest has already come, guaranteeing the rest of the harvest will rise again. And so we live with hope in the resurrection because of Easter. And then it's the Passover, Good Friday, first fruits filled in Easter. What about the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost? Well, what happened 50 days after Jesus' resurrection? Well, on the day of Pentecost, many Jewish people were gathered in Jerusalem for that feast, celebrating the harvest of wheat, another kind of first fruits feast. And on that day, the risen and now ascended Lord Jesus poured out his spirit on the church. And 3,000 people became Christians on that day. And the church was launched. And a harvest of people coming to Christ was beginning. And the rest is still coming in even today. So the, the spirit is poured out as a first fruits of the new creation to come. And people are coming to Christ as the first fruits of a greatest, greater harvest of spiritual resurrection as well. So do you see that even the calendar of Leviticus makes us wise for salvation in Jesus Christ, as the Apostle Paul said? It's not just a random ancient calendar. God structured it to shape Israel's values and to prepare them for Jesus. And then Jesus came and he just stepped into this calendar. And of course, it doesn't just follow every chronological event. The Day of Atonement is also fulfilled at that Passover. Um, there's an overlap of these feasts. It's not just a rigid calendar and schedule. And so Jesus came just as God planned all along. And so we've seen Israel's calendar and Jesus's fulfillment. And now finally, our lives. What are we supposed to do with this calendar now? Well, let me share what I think we don't need to do with this calendar first. Or maybe I should say what is a very optional way of applying this. And that optional application would be to live with a Christianized version of this calendar. So here's what many have done with this, and it's a fine thing to do. I just want to be clear that it's optional. 
They recreate these rhythms that God gave Israel, but then they Christianize it in light of the fulfillment in Christ. So since Jesus has come, we create a calendar that emphasizes the fulfillment now. So we can live in the rhythms of Advent and Lent and Passion Week and Ascension and Pentecost and so forth. And some traditions let this strongly shape their life together. So you, you may come from that background. And every Sunday morning was plotted within that calendar narrative. And that's a fine thing to do. Calendars are powerful. We're letting all of our time get shaped by some calendar anyway, right? So why not be shaped by this kind of rhythm? So getting shaped by those can be good and wise. It can even be a powerful way to shape new values in light of our culture. So if you're oriented to do that, that's great. But while it can be wise for some to do, we just need to recognize that it's not required. So this whole symbol-laden calendar was required for Israel, but it was temporary. And it was not pointing forward to a Christianized version of the calendar. It was pointing forward to Jesus and the new life that he gives. So the New Testament doesn't give commands to Christians to observe this kind of calendar. And I doubt that in the resurrection and, and fulfillment of the full new creation, I doubt that we'll have this kind of calendar operating. And New Testament Christianity leans heavily in to the fulfillment of that coming age because that has broken in to the present. So it leans into the new creational fulfillment because it's begun. Jesus started it. He's the first fruits. He's already poured out his spirit. So here's my point. The application of this text is not primarily to see how we should have a life-shaping calendar like this and then see how Christ fulfills it and then, you know, tweak the calendar from Leviticus. It's a fine thing to do, and we do a bit of that here as a local church, right? Celeb commemorating, commemorating Advent and Good Friday and Easter and so forth, but it's just important to recognize these are optional. So if a church doesn't focus on Advent, they're not being unbiblical. They're not doing something wrong, and a church that does more of this is not being wrong either. Um, these are optional, and they can be wise, but we need to recognize that we don't have to. So, whenever Paul addresses matters like special days, he says it's a matter of preference. And I'm emphasizing this in part because we need to do everything we can to cultivate Christian unity, right? Because people that recognize there's so much division among Christians then want to throw out the things that we need to hold dear and can't compromise on. The, the primary issues of the gospel. But then others will encourage separation over these kinds of secondary matters, which we shouldn't do. Let's be unified around Jesus and the main things, and then give each other latitude with the things that we can have latitude, give latitude over. So, for example, Colossians 2.16, Paul says this, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Same language that the book of Hebrews uses for Leviticus all over the place. It's a shadow, a symbol-laden structure to teach Israel to prepare for Jesus, and Jesus is the point. And then Romans 14, 5, he's talking to a church that actually was getting divided over some of these matters. Because in that first century, you have people that come up, came out of their Jewish tradition and still wanted to celebrate some of these things. And then you have people who had no clue about a Jewish tradition coming to Christ, and they're like, do I need to observe these things? Do I need to Christianize? What's going on here? And they're feeling condemned or despised and despising others. He's trying to bring unity. And so he says, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Can we, and this is where that statement comes from, the, the culmination of this is welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So we want a gospel culture of welcome. And so that applies to how we think of the calendar. So I, I'll say all this, um, and it's just my view here now. I know other Christians disagree, but I think this also applies uh, to the weekly Sabbath. So I see, and again, this is me, uh, and a lot of Christians disagree, so I follow. If you want to kind of look up other resources, I'll send you like Don Carson, Tom Schreiner, some other writers who have done some good thinking about this. 
I see Paul saying that the whole calendar, including the weekly Sabbath rhythm, is ended and fulfilled in Jesus. So we no longer need to regard one day as more sacred than others. The weekly rhythm was a temporary, symbol-laden schedule. It pointed forward to the reality of Jesus and the new creation. And when Jesus came and the new creation dawned, that was then done away with and fulfilled. Now, I do think there's still a wisdom principle in a rhythm of work and rest in societies that don't have one end up having all sorts of problems. And uh, Christians need to gather regularly like we do. Um, but I would say it's not required to have it on a weekly rhythm like it was for Israel on a certain day of the week with the whole day given to certain activities. So again, many disagree and they have thoughtful reasons. I know many of you do. So I'm happy to talk it through if you're interested. Uh, either way, we should be prioritizing our regular gathering together. Our culture is making Sunday morning a holiday for sports, and that is a less virtuous holiday. So uh, that's their value. As Christians, we prioritize being with God's people under God's word. So let's be here. Um, so how do we apply this then? So here's three things this leads us to cultivate in our lives. Remembrance, rejoicing, rejoicing, and hope. And using schedules and calendars can be a helpful way to cultivate that. So first, remember your redemption. God built the calendar to help Israel live within their story, to help them see their identity was shaped by his grace, to see that they're a redeemed people. So we should live with that sense every day. So I started this service by even saying one reason why we gather on Sundays is to remember the story we're a part of to remember grace, to remember the past and the present and the future of God's redemption to shape our identity. Jesus gives two ordinances or sacraments to remember this. So the first is baptism, and the second is the Lord's Supper. So baptism happens one time, marking the beginning of your life of faith, and then the Lord's Supper happens repeatedly. It's our new Passover meal. And so we celebrate that regularly. We want to remember Jesus with the Lord's Supper. And we want to remember him not just when we do the Lord, we participate in the Lord's Supper, but every day, throughout the day. This is our new identity. We're forgiven people and rescued people. So second, so remember, and then second, rejoice in Jesus. Many of these events in Israel's life were parties. They were to gather together as an assembly and rest and rejoice and feast together. They celebrated God's goodness. They celebrated his redemption. They were loved by God. He was meeting their needs, and so they feasted together. So I think we could say that throwing good parties is a Christian virtue. Some of you are really good at that. You are very hospitable, and you just make every event better. Some of you are going to be having people over for the Super Bowl. And maybe you don't even care about the Super Bowl, but you're just going to have people over because you love to get people together to bless them. That's a reflection of where history is going, feasting. And so we rejoice together. And then that leads then finally to cultivate hope. These feasts not only celebrated past redemption, but pointed forward to new creation. So they, they pointed forward to where all of history was going, where God would restore the Feast of Eden, where his people were to feast of all his abundance in his presence with the fullness of joy really a central thread through all of history and the whole Bible is this theme of joyful feasting in the presence of God. That's, that's what he is giving Israel in these feasts to celebrate. That's why Jesus came and he had a reputation, right? They said the Son of Man came eating and drinking. One author said, if you read the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is just eating his way through the Gospel of Luke. He's just at parties. Uh, he's feasting with people. Um, and then he gives the Lord's Supper in the context of a meal. We don't celebrate in the context of a meal anymore, but that would have been its original setting as a celebration with serious reflection on sin and grace and re great rejoicing on grace. And then so we're looking forward to the feast to come. So let every good feast you have, every good feast you, you throw, let it be a pointer and a reminder of where all of history is heading, a joyful feast in God's presence. Let's give thanks.
Father, we thank you for Israel's calendar and how in that calendar you communicate your wonderful, life-giving, redeeming, joyful plan of redemption and restoration. And so we pray for those among us whose lives feel like anything but a feast right now, that you would give them in the deepest part of their heart a seed of real joy and hope. And we pray that all of us, you would give us a tone together as a church family of welcome and joy as we've experienced your redemption and we're experiencing your provision and we look forward with hope to the renewal of all things and the Feast of Eden being spread again. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.